market to the next Twins ownership group. If there is one, leader fan, Fan Radio Network. We know it's not good baseball. And KFAN. Dot com. Two minutes, ten seconds past three central daylight time. Welcome back. It is a Tuesday edition of the Bumper to Bumper show. I am the a-hole in the afternoon. My name is Dan Barrero. Guardsy produces the show. And we will be we will be here tonight till is it 615 or the 6? 615. 615 this evening. We're out early every day, I believe, the rest of the week. But I don't feel guilty about it because we went the distance yesterday. <laughs> it was a slog. We went all the way from three until 6.30 p.m., and uh, we hope you stay along for this ride all the way until we wrap things up half uh, a quarter past the hour of 6 o'clock on what I would classify a beautiful fall Tuesday afternoon here in the Twin Cities. You, of course, down on it because you just spent some time yes. in Southern California. Uh, the good news is we're headed back to the 70s. I think it's another cold night tonight, right around freeze, about 32. Protect your plants. Protect your plants. Uh, but then I think we're headed back towards the uh, 70s for close to a week for the highs, which is pretty good, we'll I take think, that. for this late in the year. It's October. Today's Tuesday, October 15th. It is, mid-October. Yeah, Mid-October is what they call it in the business. It is Lions Week to help us celebrate. Kevin Seifert will join us in studio beginning at 4.02 today. 4.02, Kevin Seifert. And Luigi's back. Lou Nanny is not only back on the show, he's back in studio, Garzi tells me. He will join us. In the 5 o'clock hour, starting with, I'm assuming, the top five at five. And we'll talk about whether Wild fans already have some some significant worries that they uh, are enduring once again. The season has barely begun, and it appears we're already in crisis. At least that's what it looks like from this shock jock. I uh, hope I'm wrong. Those are our two guests today. The Bradshaw and Brian Cafe and text line is open 646 646- Eight six. You know, Gargi, there's been so much said, spewed, and written about the blockbuster bombshell news broken by Joe Polat as sort of the chief steward these days of the Minnesota Twins, announcing that the Twins are ready to sell. Doesn't mean they will sell. But their intention is to sell the baseball uh, team after how many? Four decades? Five? Whatever it's been. It's been a long time that um, the poll ads, several poll ads have owned and or sort of, you know, run this organization. I don't want to keep looking back. I don't know that it serves any useful purpose at this point to continue to look back. I choose as always, because I hate wallowing in the past. You know that. Yep. I prefer to look ahead. And I prefer to turn this program today into what I'd like to think is a public service, an opportunity for potential new owners who might be, you know, mulling over the idea of making a legitimate bid for this club. And I believe there will be bids for this club. I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be sold. I think there will be bids for this club. And Maybe our job should be, how can we help them? How can we help prepare them for what they would be walking into? Oh, sure. What this market is like. What they might not know without the sort of magical insight that a program like this can offer. I'm not one of us. I grant it, but I now have been here for almost 40 years. I think I have a decent handle well, I'm too stupid to understand the game. That I already know. But baseball, I, baseball, oh, of yeah, course. It's, 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 yeah. it's we have no idea how baseball works. The, it, exponentially too smart and and complicated and nuanced a game yep. for a basketball guy like me. For sure, uh, tennis guy. No you chance. think I understand? Yeah, Especially now with baseball, correct? Yeah, where it's just strikeouts and home runs. How am I supposed to understand it? You can't. You don't. So you don't. Don't pretend. I don't even try. You, don't even pretend. I don't yeah. even try. Um, but we can, I think, give them some ideas about what they might look forward to or what this might be like if they try on this market uh, for size. Example. You're never going to be beloved for long. I really don't buy the notion that you can ever expect as an owner 
to be absolute like like your name is announced wherever you are i i most of the time you're going to get booed even if your stewardship has been good it's still likely you're going to get booed now early you might get cheered but eventually fans don't generally i think like to root for owners uh they're all greedy billionaires right we tolerate them some more than the others we've had some you know Early um, honeymoon periods with, God, Norm Green, uh, Red McCombs. I remember Red being introduced his first preseason yeah. game as Vikings owner. And a lot of it with Red was he was somebody else. He was a single person as opposed to the gang of 10. And beyond that, the team, didn't the team get off to a good start with him? I think that had something to do with it yeah. as well. So even though he might not have had anything to do with it, well, he's the owner, so therefore you associate goodness with the owner. You might have stretches like that, but I don't think anybody who wants to own a, a, a major sports franchise should ever expect that forever and ever they're going to be beloved, that they're going to get a statue. Are there any owners in the history of major sports, major professional sports, who has his own statue <laughs> outside of a stadium? Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. There's one of Carl and Eloise outside of Target Field. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I wonder whose idea that was. Oh. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. Is that the only place? Well, Arthur Blank, the Falcons owner, just didn't he just Did he put himself, one for himself in the team's ring of honor? Well, let's put it this way. I don't think fans would necessarily vote for it. Vote for that taking place. Yeah, got you. Now, you will have a honeymoon period here because you're different. You are somebody else. You are, by definition, not the villain or the villains who are are leaving the organization. No reason you can't milk that, but you should never, I think, I mistake that for anything but short-term adrenaline rush that's probably not going to last unless every year your team is really good, and then it might extend. And you can extend your honeymoon here in another way. If you say during your first presser, and a lot of owners don't even like to give pressers, but I think early they almost have to. I'm thinking of this as more than another one of my businesses. I get it. It is a bottom line business. But part of what attracted me to getting involved in this sort of nonsense was, let's be honest about it, ego. I got a pretty big ego, and it felt pretty cool, the concept of owning a team. I'm not going to pretend that's not part of the story. A little disarming honesty doesn't hurt, does it? No. Ego. ego. I got an ego. Boys and girls, you're going to get used to it. I do. So some of this is about me. But I also understand that there is a public component here. Now, look, I might get burned after I've been here a while, and I might eventually do what the poll ads did. I might return to the shallow end, my tail between my legs. I won't even rule that out. But that's not where we're going to start. Frankly, there's no reason for me to be here standing in front of you if that's where we're going to start. If I'm immediately telling you, Here's what we can't do, and we can't do this, and we can't do that, and that's too much of a gamble, and that's too much of a revenue loss. What the hell am I here for then? There's no point in me going down that road. And more importantly, it's not about just words. It's about conviction. It's about what I intend to do. There's no point in me starting with that approach, right? Now, I will add to the prospective owner. They have to go in with their eyes open a little bit about the marketplace, the sports marketplace in 2024. This is a football town. This is a pro football town. There is no question about that. It's been that way as long as I've been here. You could say it, it, it went up a degree starting with the Randy Moss era. You can say a little bit of it is, re is related to the success of the team, and the team is riding high right now. But let's face it. You have to understand, if you're wanting to own a baseball team here, you ain't walking in 
grandfathered in. This is a football town. This is a Vikings town. And here's the other thing you have to know. You got basketball on your ass. Pro basketball is on your rear end. In fact, it might have passed you in some significant ways. They haven't won any titles. For much of the time they've existed here, they've been a laughing stock, but they're not a laughing stock anymore. They're a good product, hoping to get better. I think it's understood that this is going to be the hardest step, the next step to maintain and or get to the promised land ain't going to be easy. There are no guarantees in it at all. But the vibe for this team is it is well-supported. People are into it. There is a belief that even with a weird ownership situation there, that the team will be funded properly. And as long as Tim Conley stays in charge, it is well run. It is no longer a franchise looked upon as unstable, unstable, reckless, stupid, um, almost a laugh, a league laughing stock. Those days are over. This is a professional running this operation now, right? Fair to say? They're at the big boy table. They are, and and so you, you have to know that. So there, nothing's going to be easy here for all of those, all those reasons. Here's another bit of advice. Beyond knowing the market and knowing what you're up against and how, to a certain extent, it might inform some of the business decisions you feel like you have to make if you're competing in this marketplace. Surprise people. Every once in a while, not all the time, because despite what you've heard, most ball fans in this town are not unrealistic. They are not irrational. They are not hysterical. When it comes to we should be paying, we, we should be over $200 million every year. But what I think they do like to see is every once in a while, the team surprise you. So surprise us. Say, look, we're going to step up in this situation for this particular player at this particular time. And not, by the way, just when a player financially falls into our lap. But where we sort of accept and absorb the sticker shock. I can be able to do it every year. Might not even be able to do it every three years, but maybe once every 10. That's what we do. And here's another really important point. Don't let the ball guys talk you out of it. You're going to be stunned when you get here. You're going to be shocked at how many excuses will be handed to you by a segment of the population, part of the media population. I think my theory has been it's directly related to how worn down they have been by what we call in the business Polad, common calls them Polad pocket protectors. I'd say you could say Polad propagandists as well. If if it's it's funny because um, Adam Platt who we've had on the show before, has an interesting, kind of a contrarian piece about the poll ads getting ripped to the degree that they have. But one of the things he writes, and there's a, a number of interesting points in it, but in one area in particular, I couldn't disagree with him more. He basically suggests that part of what's hurt the poll ads is they're not very good in front of the camera. They're not very good playing the, the sort of the PR game. I utterly and completely disagree. They are geniuses. Well, at least they were geniuses playing that game until they went as public as they did with Right Size the Payroll. They're masterful whispering, or not necessarily them, their minions, their first and second lieutenants, whispering to the ball guys that regional deal is a mess. Still not making as much money as people would like to think. Payroll doesn't solve Every problem, you know, it's not just about payroll, even though really no rational non-ball guy people think it's just about payroll. So you'll get the chance if you want to take it, and I don't recommend it 
because you're not going to end up in a very good place either. You'll get the chance to do less. You'll be told over and over, no one should expect you to do more. There's no guarantee that you will do better as a team, as an organization, if you quote unquote, do more. And my advice, and it's free, to you is don't listen. Don't, to a certain extent, I would say, fall for the bait. Because in the end, you can do it, and you could probably justify it financially, but it's going to leave you probably in the very same place that ultimately the poll ads left themselves in. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. When I can still remember having the conversation with Jerry Bell about the new stadium and the revenues and how much revenue we're going to put in, et cetera, et cetera. And interesting piece that uh, Aaron Gleeman wrote that's gotten a lot of attention in The Athletic that's worth noting here. And that a new ownership, I think, should have this information. In 23 seasons since the contraction attempt was stopped, and we can't blame that on Joe, right? That was Carl. Yep. That was Carl Polad. But fans file it all away. I know they're stupid to do that, but they do. In the 23 seasons since the contraction attempt, the Twins have had a payroll above the league-wide average. Just average. Twice. It's frustrating. In 2010 and 2011, probably when the Twins felt like they had to do it because they'd made such a big deal about it and they knew everybody was going to be watching. Now, what they perhaps also counted on is ball guys are going to eventually have our backs. Ball guys are going to explain it's madness to think. It's just about payroll. Look at some of these teams that have advanced without it. Look at the, within the division this year. They will tend to remember the teams that fit the, their narrative. They'll forget about the teams that might have helped themselves by spending more money, and then they will forget what the particulars involving each of these teams, how those things are different for different teams at different times. Overall, during the 20, those 23 seasons, the Twins' payroll was 16% below league average for a total short, shortfall of $350 million. It's frustrating. And this year's payroll was $40 million below average. $40 million before uh, below average. You got your excuses. Regional TV deal. It's unraveled. Whatever the Twins got, it wasn't what they were supposed to get. We still don't know what they did get because most of us suspect they got more than they want people to know. But the fact is they didn't get what they were bar- that they bargained for. And moving forward, there are legitimate questions and concerns about what you're going to put together on the fly how you're going to make that kind of money, and what kind of imagination do they have at, at, in the offices of Major League Baseball about some sort of a cosmic deal that can, you know, up the ante when it comes to a number of teams like the Minnesota Twins, right? Those are all fair game. They're, they're, the, 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 so the excuses will be handed to you. They'll be offered to you. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to take them. The best line that I thought that Gleeman had in his piece, most important line, it was never going to change with the poll ads in charge. Now read that sentence carefully. That doesn't guarantee anything about the future and the next group. There's no suggestion that automatically that means it's going to be better. The old grass is greener. Yep. Right? Yep. We all know that. But what we also knew was that it was the the philosophy that governed the poll ads, which was almost always more about what we can't do. We got to tight it, tighten it up here, and then they'll whisper to the to the right people who are around the team all the time and say, "Man, we got we got we're getting bludgeoned on that regional deal. Here's why we're doing this. Here's why we're doing this. Here's why we have to do it. You understand, right? Yeah, exactly. It's business. It's business, and it's a complicated game that's just not about payroll. It's about so many things, including, well, golly, 
our best players really didn't perform all that well down the stretch. Is that payroll's fault? No. On the other hand, you could say, well, some of your best players didn't play very much. And is there some obligation when you invest in those players and expect them to be your best, your best players that you might have some, some depth at a couple of positions so that it might be a little bit easier to absorb the blow? What do we finish out? Four games? I don't even I think know. We ended I up, gave you know, up four or five games. I'm not exactly about later sure. It's like we were 12 games out, I don't think. So the biggest challenge, I think, for the new ownership group is going to be maybe also what attracts them. Nobody expects us to do anything. People have been worn down here to such a degree that they're viewed as being irrational, uh, unsophisticated when it comes to building whatever it takes to build a team if they are not willing to accept the status quo. So to that extent, you have a chance to say, we're going to look at a lot of things differently. Again, we may end up coming back to the same place. But we're not going to feel obligated to start at that particular place. And no, we really aren't surprised. I mean, if, <laughs> it's the great irony. The ball guys are mad that the Twins didn't draw as well as they were supposed to draw. And yet in the end, we all know why it happened. On the front end, it happened because of literally one of the dumbest ownership comments in the history of North American sports. And you could say, well, at least he's being honest. And I'd say it couldn't have been a more a dramatically bad miscalculation coming off a playoff season, even if you had a business right to do it, that you killed yourself that with that moment. So even while the team was in first place, a lot of, a lot of fans didn't show, right? And then guess what? If you're trying to make the fans feel guilty about not showing, what did the team ultimately do? They collapsed. So those fans, I think, can say with a straight face, well, what I really miss? Because in the end, there really wasn't as much there there other than the ability to beat the Chicago White Sox 12 out of 13 than we'd like to think at, at that particular point. So I'm hoping the next ownership group will get this information somehow, some way, and they will be prepared to think outside the box. The box in this case that doesn't exist because it has to, but exists because the poll ads perpetuated it so long. Day in, day out, whispers. This is tough. Can't do this. This guy's hurt. Well, what's this money? If we, if we, if no, what's another contract going to do for us? What, 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 in the end, logically, where are we going to go with that? So, in the end, you get talked out of anything, and in the end, you say, "Well, that's exactly why the poll ads should go." And someone else needs to be given the opportunity to figure it out. If there's another way to to move forward. Don't let. It's weird. Usually you'd say, well, don't let the fans get you down. I'd say don't let the ball guys get you down and talk you out of how aggressive you might want to be. Even if there's not, at the front end of it, financial sense. You say, I got this. I, I, I know what I'm in for here. I know I'm even taking some risks. But nothing ventured, nothing gained. That's part of the reason I'm interested in this thing. And so... You don't have to pay my bills, right? You won't have, the ball guys won't have to worry about paying my bills. I'm going to have to worry about that. Let me do it. Let me go forward. Let me, let me try this out a little bit. And eventually, yeah, I may be back in the, in the shallow end of the pool. I might write a letter of apology to Joe Polet for ever wondering that why I ever would have considered that there was another way to go about the business of doing things. Hope you believe this, first of all. The fan and two men and a junk truck. Want to give you a shot to put a grain in your hand. It is our national cash contest. Keyword today, what's today? Tuesday is cash. Go to KFAN.com and enter the keyword cash. Hey, Mr.
Texts text text are uh, being taken via the Bradshaw and Brian KFN text line. That is 64686. What comment are you referring to that was the dumbest comment in all of America, North American sports? It was Joe Polad on the radio. This was, I think, spring training, suggesting that the uh, Twins needed to right-size the payroll, that he's not doing it because he wants to, but he's doing it because he has to. And, again, it's we've, we've, we've gone over this so many times before. I do feel like we're repeating ourselves a little bit. I, the idea here was to try to give advice to the new people who are coming in so they know the lay of the land. I don't want them to walk in blind to what the, the culture is here right now, specifically the baseball culture, which I fear might make it too easy for them to follow the poll ad pattern very, you know, from start to finish. I'm, I'm hoping if you're going to buy into a situation, at least at the start, you're not interested in doing that. But it, it greased the wheels. It, it sent a message that largely blunted the excitement, quite frankly, relatively speaking, that exists. It wasn't like, by the way, the Twins went on a huge playoff run a year ago, right? They won one series. They snapped a two-decade-long losing it. streak. That's exactly it. And, and it won. was great. It was, it was fun. fun. But it, it, it's not like, I, you know, it's not like they were on the verge of winning the, winning the, winning the whole thing. But given that playoff, well, ineptitude that went back forever, it kind of seemed to break through to people like, oh, well, maybe there's somewhere to go here. And um, to be honest, we, we, we tried to warn people. We warned people almost immediately, even I think late in the season when the handwriting from the ball guys was already on the wall that Sonny Gray ain't coming back here, right? And that they're going to find a way to finesse that is – it, it it wouldn't have mattered because, A, it's too much money, which it wasn't, and, B, he doesn't want to be here, which might be true. Could have been. It might still be a little leftover baggage from, you know, the battles with Rocco about how many innings he was going to pitch. But, in all honesty, that's what started the, 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 the train headed in the wrong direction down the tracks was already there. The whispers were out, and he, he ain't going to get him back, and almost like... When we shouldn't be surprised. It's not realistic. And that's what's governed this franchise forever and ever. So from a business standpoint, you, I think, effectively take away your best business chance to succeed. If it matters to get people in seats, and it's well documented that the Twins projected another, I think, two hundred to 300,000 more than they got. Uh, in the 2024 season, and that people notice, fans notice that thing. They, they're, they're. I, I don't think that's stupid. I don't think that's short sighted. I've said all along, ownership can do whatever they want. Fans have a right to notice whatever they're doing. It's pretty simple. It's not. It's not. It's a pretty simple proposition. I, again, I know baseball's much more layered than that. Nuanced. And nuanced, and especially on the diamond, there's a, there's a lot more, there are many more more layers to it, as Lavelle has lectured us over and over again. But <laughs> I, it, 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 this, it's, it's this, that, this part of it is not a Rubik's Cube at all. You can do it. You can maybe even in your own mind justify it, but people have a right to say, yeah, I'm filing it away. I, I yeah, okay. You, you, that's the way you look at it. Well, here's the way I look at it. I, I'm, I'll you know watch on TV if I can. Of course, that's another whole story. Mm-hmm. So I, again, I, the Gleeman piece was very well done, and I agreed with a lot of it. I, I don't, I don't buy necessarily that the Polads had a chance to be like revered because I just don't think owners tend to be. Now, if they save a team, if an ownership group saves saves a team from leaving, yep. They're going to be viewed as heroes. Like Glenn Taylor was for a while. Exactly right. Yep. I get that. But that wore off. And Glenn Taylor was a bad steward in a number of ways for a long time. You could say now he's getting it right, but you also have to add that part of the way he got it right 
was the insertion of Tim Conley into the equation, and it's fairly clear that Glenn Taylor was not ambitious enough on his own to go get, to feel like he even had a chance to go get Tim Conley. That was the new guys. Now, he had to sign off on it because he, he was ultimately paying the salary, right? He's still the majority owner as we speak, so I get that part of it. But my point is, I don't think people view, most people, in fact, they want Taylor gone. So I, I don't even think if you have, you know, you're going to have highs and lows, but owners just generally aren't viewed as people that are likely to be worshipped. The only kind of owner where that might work with is is a Bill Vec. You know, Bill Vec, the maverick, who, again, was not a billionaire. He, I don't even know if he was a bleeping millionaire. He got money together. He cobbled money together yep. uh, in Chicago and Cleveland. And he was, I think, beloved because he was viewed, he wasn't viewed as a corporate guy, right? He was a, he was a ball guy in the best sense of the term. But I, so I don't know that anything they do means, anything you do means you're going to be beloved. I do think, though, you can uh, put yourself in a better position with your clientele, if you don't immediately upon a little bit of success, uh, put the, the you know your arms in the air and say that was I agree that was fun, but that's we're closing her down. We're 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 and anybody who believes with a straight face that a loss of thirty five million dollars to this payroll with an injury riddled roster didn't make a difference. We'll never know if it was the difference. Didn't make a difference has been whispered to by the Polad propagandists for too long. They, they've just they've just been worn down and they've accepted, uh, uh, you know, this. They're so accustomed to it that that's their kind of their automatic, you know, fallback position. Yeah, well, this this just was not a very realistic situation. So, um, I I don't have like. You've talked about, we've talked about together and separately. There's absolutely zero. It's like anytime you hire a coach, frankly, yep. that the next person is going to be better. But the, I thought, again, the best line Gleeman had was it was never going to change with the poll ads in charge. Th- this was going to be the, the way the team was run. They feel like that was the responsible way to do it. God bless them. It was their team. It's their team. But the only shot at somebody being perhaps a little more creative or maybe even not even having the baggage of the Polad tradition here, which, again, let's remember, yes, two World Series a long time ago. They count. But an effort to move the team and to contract the team. And we can argue about how serious either one of those guys doesn't doesn't really matter. But it's almost like even though that's not Joe, he still has feels this this there's this tick like well I, I he's got other poll ads whispering. This is how we do this things. This is how son. we do things here. Like, don't be stupid. Don't do not be emotional about these sorts of decisions. Well, maybe the next guy will be willing to be a little bit more emotional. We don't want him to be recklessly emotional. We don't want a guy who basically now tries to do make the trades, right? Yeah, there's a million ways this can go with owners in 2024. They can end up doing the next group could be more destructive in different ways. We don't know, but what the, there was only one certainty, and that was nothing substantive, philosophically speaking, was going to change with this same family in charge. So God bless them. I hope they get a good, you know, I I do hope they get their valuation, their valuation. And I do hope that, you know, there's an actual deal because none of this stuff is easily done at these prices, especially now. And they're going to come together in two weeks. When your two best players that you're counting on, one of them you went out and got aggressively in Carlos Correa and then lost him twice. So then he had to come back here because of failed physicals. And your other one is Byron Buxton at a wonderful price. Why? Because of his injury history, yes, it might make sense to have a backup plan, and you have to do that somewhat financially. That's point one. And then, real quick, you talk about the reaction. The example I've been given, and it's imperfect, but it's the world that I'm in most with the Gophers. When I got word, when we got word that they were going to do the ticket seat license increase, mm-hmm. and it was, well, we think we're underpriced. I said, okay, you can do it, but people are going to notice. 
and I think it's going to be dramatic. And as you recall, it was. And thankfully, they paused it, stopped it yeah. once Norwood got out of here. But you can do whatever you want, but the marketplace is going to tell you whether or not they agree with what you're doing. Correct. And the Twins fans did that this year. I think there were great, strong indications they're going to do it next year as well. We'll see where that goes. We'll see if this buys them some time and maybe a little bit more love to get back into the ballpark next year. We'll see what they do this offseason. But I don't think they're going to be sold by Halloween. I don't think they're going to be sold no. by Christmas the way these things go. So who knows how it's going to be run next year. Fans, dirty little secret. And again, the new owner needs to know this and probably will. Fans aren't obligated to do anything. They are not obligated just because you feel like, well, we're doing the best we can under this circumstance. They are not obligated to put money in your pocket. They're not. Hell, we, we get nothing but we hear nothing but criticism about how easily the Minnesota Wild fans continue to show up at the X, given the lack of uh, playoff success. Fans, it's their money. They can do whatever they want with it at any point, and that includes saying, no, I, this, uh, I'll hold off. We'll see where we are at the end of the season. Oh, you collapsed? All the more reason I shouldn't have spent the money. 612 guy. So the Twins are responsible to pay two center fielders. That's asinine. They dug their grave with Buxton and Correa. Well, in the case of Buxton, and they may well have, um, we've talked about that even moving forward, what's realistic to expect. Can you actually give yourself much of a chance to be a factor when those two players played as little as they did? And you, it, it, there's, I think, a, a belief that the Correa situation might be chronic. And in Buxton, it's just he's one of those guys whose body is too tightly wound, whatever it is. He, 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 I don't think he's soft, but I don't think there's any reason to think you're going to get more than 100 games from him. But you'll notice what the Twins did last year. They said, look, we can't replace Buxton. We know that. But what we can do is give ourselves a defensive option who's pretty damn close to what Buxton represents defensively. We're not going to get the same out of Buxton at his best offensively as we're going to get for, with this second secondary player. What was his name? Was it Michael Taylor? Was it Michael Taylor? A. Taylor. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing I think that gets really hard to do, whether it was him or somebody else, if you're shaving 30 to $35 million off your payroll. And if you choose to not do anything at the trade deadline as well. Those things, I think, should be pretty obvious at this point. It's Yes, they may have dug their grave regardless with Buxton and Correa. But as long as you're still going to field a team, presumably, you want to give yourself, all right, well, we're, we're, we're stuck with these guys. So how do we make the best of it and still try to stay above, stay afloat, right? What we do is we give, at least at one of those two positions, we give ourselves an option where when we, we're not going to get offensively what we would get from Buxton, but although I think he did, did end up hitting a few home runs, uh, we can get something defensively. The ongoing complaint most of the season, even when things were going well from a record standpoint, was that this team's outfield defense was a disaster at times. Right, people that they were just continually throwing out there, in some measure because there wasn't much choice. On this date in 1988, I I will submit to you, and I know this is going to be sacrilegious in this town. I I really believe that for a single moment, it's almost impossible to top to top. What took place at Dodger Stadium? And we've got two pieces of sound I want to try to get to here. Kevin Seifert's going to join to talk plenty of NFL, top of the hour, trades being made. a Raj got his receiver um, after throwing his last receiver under the bus for <laughs> running the wrong route. Maybe he did. I don't know. But I, I want to... Could have ironed it out at minicamp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, was that Darkness Retreat or someplace else? I think that was the Egypt trip. That was that was Egypt, yeah. But go ahead. That's got to see the pyramids. Um, so 
We've got two. Two first. What should we play first? I think we should play the play. Agree, and then go back to the Vin Scully's explanation of it. It's it's so it's game one, Dodger Stadium. Dodgers are down in the bottom of the ninth. They are down to their last at bat. Two outs, a runner on. Okay, and um, this is the Vin Scully call of. Kyle Gibson stepping to the plate. Kirk. Excuse <laughs> You love Gibby, though. I do love, yeah, that's Former true. Former first round pick. I do very much so. Um, who was basically couldn't walk. It, in effect, it was, you're going, Gibby, you're going to have to hit a home run because you're not going to, if you hit the ball on the ground to center field, they'll still probably be able to get you out at first base. On what would then be an eight to three put up, right? <laughs> so that was the backdrop. Place is filled. It's it's nuts. Dodgers are down to it. I think it's Eck, Dennis Eckersley on the mound, who hadn't given up a home run by the way since August. Here's what happened. But the game right now is at the plate. High fly ball into right field. She is gone. In a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. It's, it's important to note that that piece of tape, I think, was edited a little bit. Because in real time, what Vin Scully did was let Gibson approach the plate as a pinch hitter to no words, to a crowd going abs, Dodger Stadium, losing its mind. Now, eventually, he did speak, and he laid the groundwork beautifully. He talked about he had injuries in both legs and just basically how he has he can't move. But before the play, just as he's approaching the plate, Vin's not saying a word. And in the real tape, in real time, after the home run, Vin Scully didn't speak for a minute. He allowed the moment to breathe, the celebration to indeed take place. Now, the other piece, of, which is why he was the best, uh, the other tape, the piece of tape we're going to play or other um, item that we think kind of adds to another layer of richness to the story is the famous Vin Scully look back at what had taken place during the commercial break leading up to eventually... Gibby leaving the Dodgers clubhouse, not the dugout, but the clubhouse to make himself available for pinch hitting duties. Here's how Vin remembers it went. It's hard to believe 32 years have gone by since Kirk Gibson's dramatic ninth inning home run. You've seen it. You've read about it. I'd like to tell you what went on in the television booth that night. First of all, it's now going to the bottom of the ninth inning, and we're in commercial. And I just happened to do, which I would rarely do, I said to the producer, do me a favor. When we come out of commercial, follow me. In other words, whatever I say, put the camera and follow my words. So we came out of commercial, and sure enough, when I said, if you were here, the first thing you would do is look into the Dodger dugout. Wham! Up came the picture of the dugout. Producer now knew what I was trying to do. And I said, if you look carefully in the Dodger dugout, and the camera now panned the whole length of the dugout, I said, obviously, Kirk Gibson is not there, and so obviously he will not play tonight. Little did I know exactly what was going on inside of Gibson's head as well as his heart. He was sitting in the trainer's room all alone, two big bags of ice, one on each leg, looking at the television set and listening to me say, and so it's obvious that Kirk Gibson will not play tonight. Typical reaction from Gibson? Fertilizer or a reasonable facsimile. And then he said to the clubhouse man, tell Tommy I'll be right down. 
Well, none of this was going on to our knowledge. And then, as I happen to say, well, look who's here. And here comes Kirk up the steps into the dugout, a bat used as a cane, and the rest is history. But I've always kidded Kirk. I've always told him, if I hadn't said that and stimulated him, made it angry to swear at the television, that might be my greatest contribution to that night and that World Series. How about that? Heard that story before, but today's the day because this is the uh, the date in which that took place. And there's a we've talked about this, I think, before. There's a famous photo that um, shows it's it, the outfield as the ball is landing. Pat, you know, clearly the game is over. The Dodgers have won it on the home on the two run homer by Gibby, and beyond the edge of the right field stands, there's a parking lot. And you see at least one car with its brake lights on. Now, realistically, the brake lights could have been on for a million reasons that there was traffic jam. But symbolically, what everybody's taken out of that, of course, is somebody left early. And all of a sudden, they hit the brakes, finding out that their beloved Dodgers won. I don't, again, I, I don't know how you top it when you factor in. It's the natural moment, right? In real life, where a guy who's dead, his, his, his legs are shot is able to come in and, again, knowing that basically he's got to hit the ball out of the ballpark, and he's facing a really good pitcher Dennis Eckersley. who hasn't given up a home run since August. And you say, well, no, no it, that can't happen. But it did. It happened on this date. What year did I say it was? 88. 1988. So after the year, the Twins won the world, the, their first World Series. It's a Hollywood story, it's, Dan. It's what it is, and it's also why um, Scully is was obviously the best at what he did. Uh, top of the hour pause here. Let's talk some football. A lot of baseball early. And uh, we'll talk football with uh, Kevin Seifert, who I know was watching the Monday Night Football game last night. There have been some significant trades. I don't think we're involved in any of them. Will we be? I doubt it, but who knows? Uh, all of that with um, Seifert. If you have questions, hit the text line 646 